the Spot Track Podcast, talking sports contracts, the salary cap, and business of sports. Welcome to another edition of the Spot Track Podcast. My name is Mike Chinetti. It is Monday, December 18th, week 15 of the NFL season. Nearly complete. We've got an Eagles, I guess a pretty important Eagles game now with the Cowboys taking a step back yesterday. They can kind of control their own destiny from the here out. We'll do a little bit of football. Dan Soman's going to join me for the duration of this segment. A little football, a little baseball, and uh, we'll get ourselves prepared for the end of the year here when we do our Spot Track Year in Review show. Probably coming up, oh, I don't know, um, a little bit after Christmas is what we're going to do with that, which is where we look back and reflect on our favorite contracts and our favorite, I guess, trades and transactions and all sorts of moves from not just the big four sports, but across the world, right? Some PGA mess and live golf mess, and I'm sure Scott's going to bring some of our soccer leagues, uh, maybe some of the racing stuff. F1 certainly had another year, but we will do our year in review here coming up here a few days after Christmas. Always a good time to do a little round table episode, but today the normals pay the bills with the NFL a little bit, talk some quarterbacks and spin around what has been an escalated major league baseball free agent off season and some trades to get to as well. Dan, welcome to the show. I'm going to start with baseball, and I do want to get to some football with you as well, but um, pretty surfacey stuff. We would be remiss if we didn't start with the Dodgers. Can we Can we do an entire Dodgers segment without saying the word Otani? Can we do it? Because everything now is just icing on the cake here, right? It's actually, actually filling in the holes and filling in the blanks. And uh, they started that process by acquiring Tyler Glasnow from Tampa, a move I think you predicted. I know that you had the Dodgers and the Braves heavily in on Glasnow. This is not a name that I was super excited for, as I know you know. Um, you know, I, I know the Dylan Ceases of the world, the Corbin Burns of the world have contract complications that came with them, but so did he. And the Dodgers have already paid him. We'll talk about the contract in a second here. Um, talk me off the cliff of why this player isn't just going to be another injured Dodgers pitcher, because that's that's what's happened here to this starting rotation for the better part of five years. And they're going to limp into 2024 with two or three players either recovering or saying their full strength, but coming off of really bad injuries in 2023. I, I don't know why this isn't just another version of that and now a more expensive version of that. It's a good it's a good point i don't specifically know how to reject it um yeah in term there there are obvious injury risks there but i also think at the same time you're getting um a front end starter uh, undoubtedly when he is healthy they needed pitching immediately um mm-hmm. i'm to be honest, I'm okay with them going this route, um, considering they did extend him, which I know that might be backwards thinking, but um, I like the extension in terms of um, it's not it's not lengthy. Like they didn't take on an enormous amount of risk. It ta- t- it checks <clears throat> multiple boxes in terms of mm-hmm. their immediate needs with the pitching staff. Um, he can be an anchor. The, the I think the the biggest question mark really is the health. Um, the yeah. Stuff, so. <clears throat> yeah. And, and they, they don't really have any room for error this year. You know, if they're going to go out there and compete this year, you know, Fangraphs has him slotted in as the ace of this Dodgers rotation right now ahead of Walker Bueller. That's probably arguable. Both of these players are now coming off of injury seasons. You know, Bueller has 12 starts in the last two full seasons. You know, he, 2021, he was a full boat player and he was excellent. But he that's really been his only year, Walker Bueller. And, and if you look at Glasnow's resume, it sort of looks like that. You know, a, re, a couple of really great seasons mixed in with inconsistency. And, and it's not like the Dodgers are shying away from this. They're saying out loud, we know what we're getting here. And we're not going to try to make him a 250 inning player. And we're not going to try to get 35 starts out of him. But they need a player who can <laughs> go 35 starts and be that bell cow 200 inning player. That player is not on this roster right now, in my opinion, and and they're not done. They're not even close to done. I I guess what I'm saying is, are they going to go all, all in here, Dan, over the next couple of weeks? Like, are they in on Corbin Burns? Are they in on all of the B pitchers that we're going to talk about over the next month or so? Is this going to be all about 2024? 
or are they realistically thinking about 2025 here when I guess Otani would be back on the mound when they could have a little bit, you know, a little bit more flexibility. Maybe some of the kids, Bobby Miller and those players are more established as experienced MLB players. The, the general consensus, right? The public is going to be watching every move they make in 2024. But if you're in that front office right now, what are you saying, you know, to the players, to, to, to the organization? Is 2024 a realistic championship year for them? And if so, do they have to really push this pedal down even more right now? Oh, it's they're always in a contention window, um, especially with the lineup. It's still one of, if not the best um, offensive lineups in the league. The pit, The pitching is still good. In my opinion, they just needed... Last year, they were specifically lacking like an anchor. Now, Walker Bueller is coming back off of like he he maybe was ready at the end of last year. So assuming he is like it sounds like he's going to be healthy entering this year. Mm -hmm. um, That's like a front end guy. You have glass now if they get another one via trade or signing um, via free agency. I, I don't think they're really that far away from just like being the uh, the best up and down roster like in in some of my circles there's talk that bobby miller is like a is like a yeah a, a, a dude a, a, yeah <laughs> like a breakout ace candidate next year i mean i don't want to like set the goal the bar too high here but i'm just saying there's a possibility where they end up with four front end starters by the end of this day. like what what in when we're sitting at the end of 2024 we may be like laughing at our assess our early assessment of this this pitching staff and then you add in the endless yeah. arms in the in the rotation plus the offensive lineup i mean they are a definite contender this year and going forward i mean the scout i i, I keep preaching the scouting department the inner their their role in international free agency they're going to keep pumping out prime players. And it, it, as long as they like don't collectively miss on a bunch of these, uh, I don't want to say high risk, but like uh, aggressive moves. Like that's where the Yankees went wrong. In my opinion is they did similar things and they just were wrong on all wrong. the players they tried to identify. Right. So I'm not trying to get on yeah. a tangent here, but just comparatively the Do- I trust the Dodgers way more to hit on these things, and that's why I'm way less worried about Glass now. Even if he is only a two, three year pitcher, I like that you mentioned the um, <clears throat> how they're going to manage him. I I don't think it's necessarily they're like going to hope or or they don't think he'll get thirty starts from them. It's that they can really manage him to five innings. He may not want that. He hated it when he was with the mm-hmm. Rays, but. Um, from an injury perspective, I, I think this is one of the best rosters he could have landed on in this situation to not be leaned on too heavily going forward, even though they do need him like from a, uh, you know, they need him to throw five innings every five days. Let's right let's now they that. do. But I, I think you and I both know there's another horse coming, whether For it's sure. Yamamoto, you know, they're probably third right now in the Yamamoto race. I, I, I wouldn't think that they that they get him even though why not right why wouldn't he pick the Dodgers it seems like the New York teams are really going above and beyond to court him away uh, which makes sense both those teams need him more than the Dodgers do right now but uh, this team has the, the, in acquiring Glasnow they acquired Manuel Margot who is now a role player for them he's an off the bench outfielder who should be starting for 29 other organizations in this league right now is that a flip it could be Right, that 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 could be one of the centerpiece players with a prospect to go and get Corbin Burns away from Milwaukee. There's no question that that's in the back of their pocket right now. So they're making moves to make other moves. Something that we've seen the Braves do three times this year already. It's what good teams do. They don't they don't just sit around. They're they're playing chess, not checkers. So I have a feeling that they already know exactly what plan A, plan B, and plan C are. Plan A probably being Yamamoto, and then they'll deflect back to plan B when that doesn't happen. But once they get that next name on this rotation, all these concerns go away. Bueller can miss half the year. Glasnow can miss half the year, and they have coverage. And oh, by the way, they're going to have prospects to be able to trade in July as well. As, as you've noted, this is not a team that is has paid for this roster. They've paid for a lot of it but they have paid in balance in conjunction with bonus pool drafts and their own drafts. And by the way, Walker Bueller, Bobby Miller, 
both first round picks for this organization that have now grown and developed into this timing. So the timeline's perfect. It feels like a perfect storm. I, I guess my initial question was simply because of Otani's status, because of maybe some inconsistencies and a lot of new, right? Anytime there's a lot of new coming together, it takes a minute to gel. If this team doesn't win in 2024, I feel like the baseball world is going to call it a loss. And I'm not sure they do right. I'm not sure that's how they're limping into this season. You know what I mean? I think they understand that maybe we take, maybe this season looks a lot like last season, but man, are we going to be damn good in 2025? So I'm, I'm just preparing myself mentally for that because how many organizations, the Mets, the Padres, et cetera, et cetera, go in like this, right? Put the pedal down, go in and then immediately rip it up now six months later because they've spent $400 million and the owner is basically saying, what did we just do with ourselves? So that's not what this is. That's not what the Rangers are. Those are the two teams that kind of have things figured out from all perspectives. But uh, quickly on this Glasnow contract, he was he was signed for one year, 25 million coming over from Tampa Bay. They, they basically kept that intact, but restructured it into a signing bonus for this year and uh, tacked on four for 115 thereafter. One of those years, though, is a club option that can convert to a player option. So there's all sorts of kind of bells and whistles built into that this thing to help the luxury tax a little bit. However, they did lose themselves 2.3 million of luxury tax base by extending him. So it's not like you know a football contract where you bring a guy in and you lower his cap hit for this year. It was 25 million coming over. It's now 27.3 million for the next four years at least. And then that could go to 30 in 2028 if they accept the club option. So he's expensive. He's he's in the top 5% of, of starting pitcher luxury tax salaries right now. Uh, maybe even 3% if I did the math closer. So it's not like this is a value play by the Dodgers, right? They gave up prospects and they paid him essentially a top of the market contract. I had him at about 24 million. And uh, like I said, he's a little over 27 million a year now for the next four, four and a half seasons. I assume you're fine with that, right? I, it sounds like that you're comfortable that he's just under contract, right? That was the most important part here. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not sure how it would have worked out if there wasn't the contingency that he extended here, right. like in terms of prospect value going in return. But I think it was a nice trade for both sides um, in terms of what Tampa got and t- and that the Dodgers got him and were able to extend him. It is... Um, you know, a top of the market, it, it's, it's market value. It's market value to, um, mm-hmm. plus if anything. So I am okay with it considering the term. It's not like they risk, they, uh, went out real, real far here in, in my opinion. So yeah, totally good with it. Yeah. You can't, you can't have Tyler Glass now joining the Dodgers, maybe the best team in baseball on an expiring contract and letting him kind of have his showcase here. You know, that's never going to work out because if it, if it, if he's the pitcher that he, you know, he can be on a team that we know this team can be, his value soars by millions next December, right? If ever, if all the boxes get checked here. So 27 million today is probably easily 30 million plus next December. If, if they let this thing ride out, and if you think about it that way, and you think about the fact that I'm going to break my own rule, Otani's deferred money saved them 24 million against the tax this year that that has now turned into Tyler Glass now, essentially. So not a bad trade off to cover uh, their rotation a little bit, but back to our original point, there's no, there's no way they're done. There's just no way they're done. They're bringing in, if not a, a number two, some sort of number two, number three via trade or via free agency here in the coming weeks, maybe even in the next couple of days here to fortify this thing and, and really become, I, I think it's fair to say a super team, right? For sure. Yeah. For, I mean, for the foreseeable future too, they have the, they have the resources um, and ability, if you will, like the talent in their front office and throughout their scouting department, they have the resources and ability to maintain this for more than just like a three, four year window too. Like they have these guys under contract, but they're going to still keep pumping out dudes and um, they'll just keep supplementing. So it's kind of scary for the rest of the league. Uh, you know, us, well, me, at least a fan of a small market team, I, I you know, yeah, we'll never be able to compete with somebody, something like this, but um, I'll, I'll still enjoy it. Why, uh, it, you know, super teams are once in a lifetime kind of thing. So I, I'm just, candy. 
the Andrew Friedman dealing with Tampa Bay um, specifically is is fascinating to me. Obviously, that's where he kind of made his mark, and uh, you know, a lot of organizations have tried to model what he has done both in Tampa and and now in L.A. Right? He's shown how to do his version and his his analysis with a small market team that absolutely will not pay like $15 million a year is just a no, no in Tampa Bay. And now he's shown what he can do with his model and money. You know what I mean? So we, we've seen the best of Andrew Friedman in, in both a and B. Is there a world? Cause I'm just connecting dots here. Is there a world where Blake Snell is this next guy? Because yeah, actually, there's, there's a connection there, right? Yeah. And speaking like on the point we just made where there's no better team that can manage a right. player's innings, like the ultimate five and out guy is Blake Snell, right? I mean, right. He, he's good for 12 Ks, but it's going to come over, um, you know, five innings, you know, six max typically. So um, yeah, he'd be like another guy that I, and I like how you connected the dots there for sure. So yeah, yeah that would be gross if you're a nationally fan that does, isn't following the Dodgers, but <laughs> does make a hell of a lot of sense. All right, let's flip along a bit. We, uh, this one got lost in the weeds with some NFL stuff and certainly all the Otani and the Dodgers mess here, but the Brewers, speaking of Corbin Burns and players like that, the Brewers didn't sit in their hands with their top prospect, right? Jackson, Jackson Churio, they signed a zero service time extension for a player, something we don't see a lot, but I think it is something we're going to start to see more and more. You've done a lot of work on this for us um, in tracking a lot of these prospects and now tracking not only their, you know, their extensions like this, but some of their arbitration values and, and the process that they go through for six years of team control and then getting themselves the free agency. Were you surprised that this player signed this contract when he did? Or do you think, Dan, that this is just really good business for young players coming in the league before they even step into the batter's box? Yeah, I am totally on board with it from both sides. I credit the Brewers for making this commitment. Um, I mean, long term, it, it would like to me, it's a very high floor high ceiling um type of signing if you will it, like there's almost he, he's seen seemingly flew up prospect charts last year it seems like he's like the next guy uh you know like legit prospect superstar um to kind of come into the league i i think it was a, a gamble for the the 80 the 82 guaranteed is a gamble worth taking on their end and from the player side for somebody who hasn't even you know been above double a i think you just have to right. you just have to take it and and you know assume that you didn't leave you know you can't really think about the potential money left on the table 10 years from now if you will you know <clears throat> yes and no you know you, you, i, I can't if i'm an agent right <laughs> and i'm figuring out that that's the problem though right is a lot of this is driven driven from the agent because if he doesn't do this Right, if he doesn't sign this contract and it's eight years, eighty-two million guaranteed, there's two club options that can add another fifty million onto the back end of this thing. And we'll talk about some of the the structure in a second here. But you know, he's walking into seven hundred forty thousand dollars. That's that is the number. That's the minimum salary for twenty twenty four, and it's not even a guarantee that he makes the makes the team out of spring training because of service time manipulation and things like that. Right. He, you're, it's not like this player what was in AAA mashing had made it, made a name for himself visibly within this organization. You had to kind of dig to find Jackson Churio success over the past 18 months. The Brewers are taking advantage of that lack of visibility with what they hope is the next Ronald Acuna Jr. contract. You know, something that midway through already looks like an absolute slam dunk for the team and maybe a bit of a what the hell did I do moment for the player and his agent, but the agent's already gotten paid here, you know, and that's tough. That That is tough for an 18, 19, 20 year old kid to, to talk, be talked out of, you know, when, it, when an agent is saying, look, you're going to get paid. I'm going to get paid. We're going to start this thing off properly. Otherwise you're on two way minimum contracts, trying to garner up enough service time to get yourself to arbitration when you start to make a few million and it's a really long road. So I'm never going to, I'm never going to knock somebody for turning away $80 million guaranteed. That's ridiculous on my part. However, and this is something you're really doing a lot of work with this on. 
when you extrapolate this thing, right, especially the eight years, that, that means he's buying out all of his pre-arb, which is those seven hundred, eight hundred, nine hundred thousand dollar years, all of his arbitration, which you can bring some numbers to that in a second, and then two years of free agency. If we toss in the club options, and if he's a if he's a player, those are getting exercised. We're talking about four years of free agency, and he'll be turning thirty years old in twenty thirty four when he's a, actually a free agent for the first time. So. This is a 10 year, 10 year breakdown from Milwaukee. If he's a player, he'll make himself upwards of $130 million and he'll be 30 years old when he, when he becomes a free agent. So those numbers all sound great, but from an arbitration buyout standpoint, from buying out potentially four years at, what is it? About $83 million, $73 million for free agency. Where, where do you think or how much value do you think Milwaukee ends up getting here? Or did Cheerio do a nice job here to actually structure this properly? Oh man, that's, I know, I know it's the million dollar question over and over again. Right. I I I can't stress enough. Like I I am the first person, like the Corbin Carroll deal. I, I was, we came on immediately and said, he's probably leaving money on the table. I am the first to say that, but Again, I can't stress at 18 years old, the range of outcomes on a player is so huge that to like deny the 82 guaranteed, which Mm -hmm. likely turns into more um, on the hopes that you might make like, I I mean, like you're hoping to make that in over the course of your your career before you even hit free agency if you even make it six years in the league so and i and i know i just said five minutes ago that this is like (laughs) almost a sure thing i I mean no one's a sure thing but i i I guess i'm just playing it out from both sides like it's it's tough it's tough it's a it's a fine line to walk and i hope to do some uh, you know crunch some numbers here in terms of uh some of these pre-arb and arbitration deals that did get signed and in looking at values and retrospect and kind of analyzing what was left on the table, but um, projecting that forward on a kid this young, it's like so hard to do, but I, I, I sincerely understand your point. Um, he <clears throat> like those four years could technically be like short selling himself by like 75%, if not more, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, the, the Corbin Carroll contract and then certainly what he did last year has to be a massive factor here. And it, and it has to be a factor in Milwaukee getting this contract to the table. And it has to be a fact in why some of these numbers look like they do on this Cheerio contract, right? The, the arbitration years alone for, for Corbin Carroll, 36 million for Cheerio, they're going to be 32 million buying out those three seasons. That's not an accident. Okay. And if we, if we extrapolate it out to, you know, Lu- Luis Robert, Eloy Jimenez, some of these other players that have done little, zero service time contract extensions, everybody's in this 29 to $35 million ballpark. So that's just the going rate. The problem is Corbin Carroll might be an all MVP player, or, you know, an all MLB player for the next six seasons. <laughs> what he did in year one may not be repeatable, you know, but even if he's 90% of that for the next couple of seasons, he's a freaking superstar. And certainly we've seen that with Acuna outside of a couple of injuries here and there. He's a, he's an MVP candidate on an annual basis and his contracts only what 15 to 20 million more than these guys we're talking about here for a legitimate 40 to 45 home run, 60 stolen base player. I, I just worry, right? That because this whole process is so new to teams who are trying to jump the gun here versus we're not touching money before you know year five, year six of service time, which was the 40 to 50 year run for major league baseball owners. I feel like teams are really getting over on players here. And I know you're trying to, to discount that a little bit and say, look, they're just getting their money earlier. They're going to be fine. I don't know. I, I really don't know. Cause I, cause here's what happens, right? They get paid. They, they level off a little bit by year five or year six, or maybe even year seven in some of these club options. And then do, does, does the landscape look like this is just who this player is going to be now? And they actually get less money in their second big time contract because they're now an 
old vet. And I'm air quoting that, right? Because they look like they're seasoned and maybe even on the back end and starting to decline, even though they're 30 years old. So I'm happy these guys are getting their $100 million. I really am, um, especially out of the gate. I'm happy that teams are are finally putting their foot down, foot down and saying, we're going to, we're going to do it. We're not going to live on $800,000 contracts for our superstars anymore. I just wonder if we need to strike a better balance here, because while we're doing fine in the arbitration years, buying out four years of free agency is a lot. That's not something Carol did. That's not something Acuna did. So that that's the part that irks me with the stereo contract is I feel like he has left himself too much on the back end in terms of what the Brewers can own him for. Yeah, three three quick points. I Just to clarify, the teams are 100% getting it mm, over on mm-hmm. the players with this no matter what. So I don't want to like put too much emphasis on me saying I applaud Milwaukee. I just think from a commitment standpoint it, for a small market team, um, that's my angle on that. But it can't be stressed enough that in the long run, these teams are like in those later years are sorry, they're risking, they're taking on the risk in the front part of those deals for immense, immense leverage in the back part of those deals. So it, it like with this player specifically, I don't really think it's going to be an issue, but regardless to your earlier point too, I think he would have definitely been a prime candidate at 18 for um, service time manipulation. Nobody would have admitted it, but so you might like, we could technically look at it as three years of free agency if we wanted to cheat a little bit. And my like third point is at the end of those deals, it like, if he is a legit superstar, same thing with Corbin Carroll, if, he is who we think he is at the at year four service time. Those guys are prime prime candidates for Mike Trout type extensions, if you if you will. So um, that's where I think some of those back end years you can almost just throw away. But when teams are trying, you know, when teams have the leverage in terms of club options, that's where like, I don't love that those last two years are club options. I wish there was some sort of incentive based vesting option or player opt out mm-hmm. or whatever, however you want to lay it out. But otherwise I, I'm totally on board in the same realm that you are like in the long run, I would bet, I would bet any money I had that he will far out, outplay the cost of this contract so <clears throat> okay I, I mean just to put it back to Acuna who by the way was not a zero service time extension he was a 0.159 <laughs> service time right. extension so close enough right he came up for a cup of coffee at, in September with the Braves in 2018 be- before he did his deal in 2019 if you're thinking about well all we need is one of these guys to get that big second contract, right? You mentioned Trout. I, I still kind of keep him as an outlier, a kind of a unicorn um, until another one of these players steps in. Like Lewis Robert has what? Four more years. Acuna Jr. has four more years, five more years of team control on that, on that massive contract that he signed in 2019. Robert has four more years of team control. It, we're, we're on an eternity away from any of these guys that we've talked about here actually doing it because for every uh, for the names that we're mentioning for all these guys that have a chance to get that 400 million dollar payday at age 30 there's scott kingery there's evan white there's john sing there's all these guys who may not even be in the league by the time their pre-arb extensions actually finish like literally these guys are trying to hang on with minor buried salaries right now getting tossed around the league evan white's been traded three times already this is where a lot of these guys are going, right? So that's the risk. So in that regard, take your money, right? Take your $80 million up front or $50 million up front, whatever you can get. But we need to see one of these guys get to the end of these contracts and still have 15 teams trying to pay him $350 million. And then we'll know that this process can work and that, hey, we actually have some leverage here. Let's not buy out four years of free agency, right? Let's buy out or let's give ourselves ourselves a way to get out of that, right? Let's, if we're an MVP, top three MVP for four straight seasons or whatever it's going to be, one of those club options because of mutual option or something like that, let's get more creative with it is all I'm saying. Because it feels like the teams are getting 200% value on these pre-arb contracts as a way to basically to say, hey, we can either manipulate your service time and keep keep you for seven years, or you can take 80 million right now and we'll call it even. That's basically what's happening here with a lot of these superstars. Right, right. 
it, it's it hindsight is so easy on these because we probably will yeah. look like fools analyzing it um after the fact but like the scott king report so to lay this out you can people will probably keep hearing how rare this is for a player never to play in the mlb to even get this deal there were only five other guys that um right have gotten a deal like this and mike mentioned them luis robert Eloy Jimenez, Scott Kingery, Evan White, John Singleton. Um, Scott Kingery is like, like that's one that you know he had a red hot spring yeah. training, signed uh, you know for twenty four, <clears throat> six years, twenty four mil, and he's out of the league. I believe you know I don't even know if he's playing in the minors at this point. Um, but regardless, like I think that's like a player where you look in hindsight, where like maybe. Right. In 2017, people really thought he was going to be the next big thing. And now he's out of the league, but can take his um, 2024 20, mil instead of his like maybe he would have made like two million total there. So I, I don't need to break down the numbers on a, on a podcast here. But regardless, it is very rare what he did. Um, and I totally understand your point. I'm just I, like, again, it's like I, I, I'm trying to walk both sides of the, the line here, but it's really hard to tell an 18 year old that well let me um, yeah let me ask you that question specifically to try to simplify things and then i have one more name and then we'll move on are you in favor of these or do you think that 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 this is more of a team oriented thing right now do you think players should continue to do this oh no 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 i sorry i vehemently said no it's like i we deal with such large numbers every day that I don't think like, right. We gloss over them. <laughs> we're very numb to the, to $82 million, but that is like, like even in 80th of that is life changing money for most, if not all people. Right. So for a player that could literally get hit by a car tomorrow, uh, sorry, I shouldn't even use that as an example, but you know what I'm trying to say? For Yo, a player that's 18, this dude was in double a eating subway f- six days a week last year, last year, last season, that was his life. And he got handed $82 million. I get it, man. Yeah. There's no question. Yeah. So, but from like the greasy side of this is that the team, like Ronald Acuna, the Braves have saved so much money on that, not just the contract, but what he's provided in terms of world series and everything around what he has been to that team. So it's like incalculable exactly how much he has probably saved that team. But when it hits, it hits big, but there are other examples of pre arb contracts that did, that did not go well with lesser known players. But I just can't stress that the, like these teams are t- quote taking on risk with these, if you will, but they're, they're operating with funny money. They're making so much money that it's really not a risk. So they are holding these players over a barrel by dangling like a fraction of what they might make if they hit their ceiling outcome, but like a 90th plus percentile outcome is so rare for a lot of these players that like most of the time it's probably working out. I, I don't know, man. I, it's very, I tangle myself up um, in knots in terms of what they should do, but like, I'm, I'm never going to scold the player for taking 82 million, but at the same time, it is very, it's a very dirty business in terms of how much money the players or the, the teams are, are saving right. in the long run for very low, in my opinion, very low financial risk. So do you think, because we we talk about them all the time because they're so active and they're, and they're kind of bucking all the trends. Do you think what the Braves have done and continue to do is popular? Like, do you do you think other front offices th- wish they were they were operating that way and they actually had the horses in the barn to be able to make those kind of decisions and extensions, or do you think many of the owners and and front offices in the league think that the Braves are just crazy? Because if if I just quickly click through all of the contracts that the Braves have operated with over the past few years. This would be Ronald Acuna Jr.'s final year of arbitration, 2024. This would be three of four for Austin Riley. This would be two of three for Sean Murphy. This would be pre-arb two for for Michael Harris II. This would be pre-arb three for Spencer Strider. Do you understand what I'm saying? They could they could be operating on a payroll that is 25% of what it actually is right now. And I don't think anything would change. Do you know what I mean? Is anybody going to demand a trade or hold out 
of their of spring training for a contract extension. This is not how baseball works. You know what I mean? It's not how this game has ever worked. But the Braves, for whatever reason, optics, like I said, bucking the trend, trying to keep trying to build a 10 year dynasty instead of a three year contender have gone this route. How do, how do you think the rest of the league looks at the Braves right now? Um, brilliant or fools? It's a, that's a great perspective that I really haven't considered in this scenario before, but I mean, you have to assume that there's some envy there, whether that's the resources from the front office willing to commit that much money. I mean, like we, we talk so much about how much they're saving. They're still like bumping up against the luxury tax threshold every year. Right. So like they are commit, it's not like they're, um, you know, like if the Orioles got this done, they would just take the savings and, and, you know, pocket it probably, but they're, it's like, they're using every inch of their payroll to maximize that. And they're just doing that via early extensions with these guys, which like, to your point, um, they have created this extended window versus like a year by year, like it would be very year by year. If, um, all of those guys weren't locked up, right? We've been talking about impending free agency for yes. Ozzy Albies. And, Acuna, and yeah. Riley extension, right? They've just avoided that, but at cost-controlled numbers that, in my opinion, they could move those deals if they wanted to still. So, like, they're giving the play. So, I, I don't know. Again, we're in this scenario where, like, they're, they're taking on the, quote, risk, but the player is seeing that early payday, which, like, yeah. it is valuable. It is valuable to just – circumvent your six years in the league making very low money i mean even the first two arbitration years for most players are not making a a solid chunk of money so um can i give you a christmas week homework assignment now that we've kind of talked this out can can you try to take all of the braves players that have have extended Uh, there's probably what eight total if i have to guess off the top of my head and actually try to figure out what their true salary would have been in just a plain old cost controlled situation. So pre arb for Michael Harris, arb four for Acuna, arb three for, for Austin Riley. Um, and, and I just want to, I, I wonder if we can project how much the Braves are saving or losing right now in 2024 because of what they've done, right? Like how much up or down are they this year specifically? And then we can certainly look to project that, at, you know, for the years to come. But I, I, I'd love to put a number on that to see where they stand right now. And if there's, if it's actually cost effective right now, or if the real savings don't come until those players get the free agency, you know what I mean? And, and they're start buying out the expensive years. Yeah, for sure. I had this in my queue in terms of Ronald Acuna, but I hadn't really extrapolated it in terms of um, like just analyzing the entire roster. But that might be an interesting way to look at it. And I'll see what I can come up with here. But yeah, it's a it's an interesting perspective how you laid it out that like Mm -hmm. um, the risk could have easily swung the wrong way if Ozzy Albies down year was more true to what he is than, you know, him bouncing back into um, this like legit five tool player and, and, you know, all these other guys that have just hit um, the ceiling right. outcomes. So <clears throat> um, last thing, Jackson holiday is the top prospect in baseball. I don't think there's really anybody arguing that Cheerio is kind of a, uh, you know, a, a decently close number two right now. And there's some pitchers coming up the pipeline as well. He's a member of the Baltimore Orioles, a team that is right there, right? Kind of feels exactly like Arizona Arizona did last season with Corbin Carroll coming out of the gates. It, it could be a carbon copy of right? Baltimore could be a carbon copy of Arizona in 2024. Is Jackson Holiday signing a contract in the next three months with everything we've just talked about? Or do you think that it's just not the right situation for that to happen? I personally would be totally blown away, but um, because of Baltimore or because of him, I mean, Baltimore is a mess, right? The TV stuff's a mess. The stadium stuff's a mess. And now it sounds like they might sell the freaking team in the midst of this unbelievable final, finally uptake on the, up for the roster. Right? So uh, is that what's holding you back? Or do you think it's holiday and his agent, just not the right fit, not the right time. Few things here. Um, I keep hearing people like speculate if he's going to, I know they like dangled this carrot, I think, but like speculate whether he's going to make the opening day day roster. I would be totally blown away if he did a, because of service time issues. Um, and B because they have so much middle infield talent 
they're gonna i've been preaching they're gonna have to consolidate that ship some out probably for pitching at some point whether that's is it's this off season or sometime next season, they may need to play some of those guys at a major league level to get them out there, um, et cetera, Mm. et cetera. So that might be one factor here. That is, this is like way down the wormhole. Uh, Another thing is like, I I don't want to like get too far in the weeds here, but there is a certain level of upbringing and um, like financial safety in your upbringing to this as well. And uh, Jackson holiday grew up as like a, uh, like the son of a star MLB sure. player who was financially stable his entire career. Um, he is not cash strapped or trying to secure uh, safety for his family in the future. Um, they can totally wait this out. And for the Orioles who are a team that would maybe if they do want to, they obviously they would want to extend him or offer him some kind of contract, but it would not be even close to market value. In my opinion, they would be trying to lowball it. Um, in my opinion, but I could be wrong. Maybe they would just break off the exact same deal as the Jackson Churio thing right now, but I'm a little bit skeptical. Of Is that, he a shortstop, you know? Dan? Oh, yeah. Oh, I, if he can hang there long term, I think there are some questions, but he's definitely going to get a crack at it first. Yeah, for sure. I don't know that a shortstop makes any sense signing an early contract. Right. I mean, the, that position is still paying premium price everywhere, everywhere across the league right now. I'm not sure that I'm going anywhere near a pre-arb extension if I project to be a starting shortstop for a team that might be able to win a World Series in my in my controlled years. You know what I mean? Right. So I, I think I'm staying away for that. But your, your, your point about the family is extremely valid. You want to play a game real quick before we jump over to the NFL? Yeah. Career earnings, Matt Holiday. Jackson Holiday's father. He played 17 seasons with mostly Colorado, but a lot with the Cardinals as well down the stretch. Actually, more for the Cardinals than the Rockies. He was drafted by Colorado as a seventh round pick. 17 seasons, career earnings for Matt Holiday. It's actually funny this is coming up because I've been doing so a lot of work with some older players in our database in terms of service time and updating some info. Um, so it's, it's like a real interesting walk down memory lane in terms of what some of these guys like premier superstars were. Making. Oh, this guy was, uh, this guy was it, man. He was, a, he was it. Right. And by the way, dad used Scott Boris. So dad, dad has yeah. not screwed around contractually in his lifetime. He knows how to play this game. <laughs> I want to say I'm low here, but I'm going to say like 220. I want to say he signed like 10 for 180 at some point or something like that. Eight for 200, something like that. No, I've got him at 155. Oh, okay. I'm way high. Okay. Um, yeah, see. Oh, I lied. I lied. 164 total. He's got some deferred payments still coming from the Cardinals for the next seven years. 164 and change over his 17 year career. Biggest contract was seven years, 120 million with the Cardinals uh, after they acquired him in his final year of team control. So uh, there was plenty to, plenty to go around there. But you're right. This is not a, a family that is hemming and hawing about, you know, Jackson Holiday's daily daily food rate and stuff like that right like a lot of these minor leaguers have to deal with room and board right that's a big conversation piece when you're talking about money getting thrown at you i think positionally where the team is the inconsistency of that entire ownership right now which i cannot believe that they're going through amidst this uptick and uh and like you said the family history says no contract for jackson holiday so we're probably done with our pre-arb extensions in terms of zero service time guys but there's some other names um we went long here, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to nix the possible trade candidates. We'll come back after Christmas and talk about some of these guys, you know, the Corbin Burns, I'm going to say it, the Pete Alonzos of the world, unfortunately, who are still in this conversation to get moved before spring training lifts off here in February. Good stuff, man. Let's, uh, let's have two or three quick NFL conversations, and then we'll, uh, we'll call it a day. Baker Mayfield. Yeah. It's time. It's officially time because we have seen him do this with Cleveland, uh, you know, a few times. He's now consistently one of the better quarterbacks playing football every single Sunday for a Tampa team that is average. Is that fair to say? I mean, Chris Godwin's not even a real option right now. He's a he's a number two, number three wide receiver in this league right now coming off of the injury. He just doesn't look the same. And certainly Mike Evans is still one of the top premier targets in all of football. 
And there's an offensive line in front of him. There's no question. Tristan Wirfs was gonna he's gonna break all the offensive line records financially over the next couple of months here. So there's pieces to this offense, you know, and they finally got a bit of a running game. But Baker Mayfield's 20 touchdowns, eight interceptions, you know, 3,000 yards. He's doing exactly what Cleveland drafted him to be, which is an efficient, at times, gunslinger type quarterback. How do you get rid of this player? All right. He's on a one year, $4 million deal with incentives. So he'll make a little bit more than that when it's all said and done. But he is arguably the best available quarterback to hit the market here, not named Kirk Cousins, if you want to put those two kind of neck and neck. Where do we go from here, Dan? Does Tampa Bay keep him around? Does somebody buy him away from Tampa Bay at, at, at what could be a very eye-popping number this March? I mean, where are we headed with Baker Mayfield? Well, it's really great to see because I know we were sort of advocating for him here, even yeah. going back to last year when he made that uh, like those nice couple starts with the Rams. Um, we've been rooting for him to kind of land in a spot where he could succeed, and it seemingly has happened here. I think my question is, I, I totally agree. It, it's fair to ask whether they want or whether they should let him go. Um, yeah, because it's not a given that they keep this thing all together. They the, 2024 was probably going to be the rip the Band-Aid off year for Tampa Bay because of the aging defensive contracts and stuff. But this division is such a pile of crap. I, they could probably just Band-Aid this thing together and, and, and continue down this path and compete for the division again next year, right? Right. Maybe. And that's the thing is where they want to take this directionally long term. If Mike Evans is gone, um, they could just bring him back. Maybe that's an underrated point. People haven't paid enough attention to, but um, it it, it would be just like how they want to handle this organizationally, whether they just want to start over. But it's a really valid point. Nobody in that division is anywhere in terms of um, taking taking hold of it for any amount of time. So it's a good question. I, I mean, I'm fine if he stays there. Um, I'm always I, a little skeptical with people changing situations and trying to right. assume they'll replicate that. So if you remove him from Tampa, if you remove Mike Evans. There's uh, some Garoppolo not, PTSD here, right? I mean, Derek Carr PTSD. It, it, it has not gone well for halfway decent quarterbacks changing teams, right? So if it's working, keep, keep it, right? Keep it around. Keep Just continue right. to build on what you have. You're right, though. This... Mike Evans is a huge part of this conversation. You can't just say, bring back Baker Mayfield and everything's going to be great. If you lose Mike Evans this offseason, Baker Mayfield's not going to look like this. That's that's not incorrect to say, right? I I mean, I don't think so, but... No. and, and this is not some offense that has like a deep stable of, uh, of athletes, if you will. I mean, I, I'm not trying to, uh, mm-hmm. uh, I'm not trying to talk negatively about any of their players. I'm just saying most people couldn't name the wide receiver three on this team. No, I just at, call them average. This is an average offense. No question. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So um, what that looks like, if you start removing any one of the big three in terms of Mike Godwin, or I'm sorry, Mike Evans, mm-hmm. Chris Godwin, or Rashad White, who looks like a player. So I, I don't know what happens in that scenario, but, um, man, it's an interesting question. He, at least he's at least making it a, um, a, a legit question. And he probably saved his career to some degree, you know, outside of being a career backup, if you will. So, yeah, there's, <laughs> there's no question about that. It's really just going to be about where, and then for how much, but you know, if you start to flip around the league a little bit right now, you know, and, and I haven't really done it yet. I'm trying to hold off. I'm doing my, our roster, roster bubble piece right now. So I have six dozen NFL players right now on the chopping block, unfortunately. But what the next step is, you know, where do these availabilities fit, right? And and, and free agency and things like that. So I, I haven't yet got to the point of which teams need are going to need a quick fix starting quarterback. Tampa Bay is certainly one of them, but I could talk Seattle into this. I could talk Minnesota into this. You know, we could talk the Giants if we can get, to, you know, it, it, certainly the commanders. We don't know what's going to happen there with the quarterback situation. I, I think we can get to six teams for Baker Mayfield pretty damn quickly if we try. Um, but it, the, you're spending X dollars on Baker Mayfield. Let's just say it's 20. Let's just say it's 20. Let's just say it's two for 40 to keep Baker Mayfield. I don't think that's, I think I've got him at about 18 million a year. His stock's going to rise and certainly any kind of bidding war will increase that. But if Garoppolo got what he got and, you know, Derek Carr, we all know got overpaid on the open market this past year. 
let's just lowball a $20 million per year for Baker Mayfield. Well, that's a, that's a floor for Mike Evans too. You know, so we're talking about without even trying 40 to 45 million per year to bring back essentially what you're seeing on the field right now. Baker Mayfield, a quarterback and Mike Evans as the best weapon this team can have. And then you probably need to go at least one more, right? One more weapon to really fortify this thing. So you're asking ownership to go from what was probably budgeted as a dial it back financial season. And now you're asking them to spend $60 million more just to keep this band together and compete for a division. I, I wouldn't be surprised, Dan, if Tampa Bay decides not to do this. You know, There's a reason Mike Evans doesn't have a contract right now. And I'm telling you, it's because next year was not supposed to be a keep it together year. It wasn't. Baker is doing this. you know, And, and to some degrees, Todd Bowles has done this, even though I think he's replaceable as well. So it's fascinating, but I, uh, I generally keep, take a, a whole bunch of notes for podcasts right now. I'll put a Google Doc together and I'll have all these names and, and things that I want to get to. There's, I only wrote down four, four sentences. And the four sentences have to do with the four quarterbacks in the NFC South. Because <laughs> could it be worse? Like, I, Do we have any idea? Is Derek Carr just going to be a $30 million backup quarterback here? He might be. Right? What do you do with Desmond Ritter? What do you do with the Bryce Young situation? And then certainly, what do you do with Baker Mayfield? It's just a complete what if um, unknown. And I, I don't know if I'm a team that can win a division. I'm trying. I'm going to spend the money to win the division, but uh, it feels weird. It feels like the whole thing could blow up, and nobody would really argue it too much. Um, where are you with Kyler Murray? I don't think I've asked you specifically this question. Another team that for different reasons, has a lot going on negatively and positively. Are, are you in the boat of they just need more weapons on that team and then Kyler Murray will look will look like he looked? Or is there a part of you that worries that he is not going to get back to that all-pro status? I This one is tough. I Really tough. I think this is a lot like the Justin Fields situation where I think like both things can be true as in, I think he can still be a really successful quarterback in the league, but I also can think it's true that the team should want to move on and just reset um, based on their, in their greater timeline, if you will, like Arizona needs so much, they need so much that I don't even know if um, a, a Kyler return to MVP like caliber player would even do it for this team. Do you know what I mean? So like yeah. from that perspective, I think you should just reset and let him go elsewhere. But, but I, I don't know. Am I, am I off on that? Like that's well, how I feel with fields too. It's just like the greater context of the team shouts. Maybe you just like draft a young quarterback. If you're in the position, like this is all contingent on them being in position to draft the top guy, right? The, like, the comparison is perfect. The comparison is perfect. Cause the bears will have the number one pick here. We think, and it looks like Arizona is going to lock themselves into the third pick. So you're, it's the right comparison with one with one big difference, right? Kyler Murray has 150 million guarantee left on his contract, and Justin Fields has three million left. So the Bears can easily just say, "Hey, we're going to trade Justin Fields, and uh, and and select the best available quarterback at number one, and that's going to be our life. Well, maybe we'll get ourselves a second and a third for Justin Fields, and." actually be able to put an offensive line around this new quarterback and, and do this the right way this time around. Arizona, you're right. They've already backed themselves in the wrong way, right? They are facing backwards, heading into every single game. They have a quarterback who probably in the right situation will be, would, is great, you know, and, and would flourish and would look like one of the more versatile players in the entire league, you know, if his, if mentally he can get himself there, but they're three offensive linemen away. They're two weapons away. They're eight defensive players away from being in contention, really, on every single week, week to week basis here. So uh, the problem is this. We just talked about it with Baker a little bit. If you can get Baker for on a, on a three for 60, right? Let's just say that on a free agent market, that's what he goes for. All right. And you can get Kirk Cousins on a two for 80 or whatever he would cost. Um, you know, as his career kind of dwindles down here and I, I, whatever, you know, there, there's going to be some other names. Geno Smith might hit, hit the open market, et cetera, et cetera. Is anybody going to give up draft capital for Kyler Murray? Is he a tradable player? 
You know, just take the take the dead cap and take the contract away from it. Just know that it's about forty million a year for the next four years, fully guaranteed. That's about where we're living right now with Kyler Murray, um, give or take. You know, a few million here or there, up and down. Is that a tradable contract right now? Can Arizona do what Chicago is probably going to do with Justin Fields? It's a good question. I really don't know because I'm trying to think of it through the lens of Justin Fields where like would would a team acquiring him rather have the contract in place or would they rather the flexibility of getting trading for him to get a look? Phenom- and then- Phenomenal. Can I restate my question and maybe make it easier on you? Yeah. If you because I think maybe both will be sitting out there like this. If you have the ability to acquire Justin Fields or Kyler Murray as is tomorrow, which one are you taking? I'm going to operate under the premise that it would be somewhat similar draft capital, correct? Like just in terms of like a team acquiring him would be selling the fact, sorry, team acquiring Justin Fields would be selling the fact that it's a rental, it's a potential rental and that they're not going to, have yeah. him long term, right? So, like, you're probably going to undersell that, as in you have no other move. But I don't know. I, I'm probably misinterpreting the market, but under the premise that they're similar, um, yeah, I think that's fair. I, I guess, man, I don't know. It's tough. Fields, I guess, but it's because of the, because of the money or because of the player, I think because the, of the football. I think the the age plus mm-hmm. like the non major knee injury like that that's a little bit scary i think they're i i like from a passing perspective i would take kyler but like i don't really know how that plays long term if he loses like he's gonna sorry let me just simply say he's kyler's gonna probably lose his rushing ability quicker than justin fields right i don't think both of them are like premier pocket passers then i'm gonna probably side with the younger guy let me just frame it that way i guess Five games so far for Kyler Murray, 62% completion percentage, four tu- four passing touchdowns, four interceptions, three rushing touchdowns, five fumbles. He has a 78 passer rating right now. It's bad. It's like, oh, yeah. it's like really bad. It, it, that's, that is not something you want to hang your hat on right now, heading towards March in terms of showcasing a player for a trade. And oh, by the way, there's 150 million guaranteed left on it. We're, we're at a point, Dan, where I think if I, if I try to answer my own question, I, I think Arizona has to eat some of this contract to trade him. Oh, for sure. You know what I mean? This has to be like a baseball move, which is ironic because he's a baseball player. But I, I, I do think that's where we're headed. And, and oh, by the way, I actually think that might be the best move for this organization. Right, rip this thing all the way off for Christ's sakes. Release James Conner. Don't sign Marquise Brown. Right, Zach Ertz is already off the roster. Defensively, you've got nothing to hang your hat on. Nothing. I, I, I mean, I think you could absolutely go all the way down right now. The question is this, though: If you're doing that, why are you taking a quarterback at number three overall? I'm not even sure you can do that. I, I think you have to trade Keller Murray and then draft the left tackle, right? Move back from three to six, draft, draft the best left tackle, acquire more draft capital and, and really do this thing the right way. I don't think anybody's doing that in Arizona. I don't think anybody's taking that for that, that action, but I think it, just to finish on this, Justin Fields being available, which I think he's going to be, is going to stop Arizona from being able to trade Kyler Murray. So they're probably going to have to run it back and hit their head against the wall again in 2024 and hope that Marvin Harrison Jr., because that's probably the pick, right? Hope that he can revive this offense single-handedly with some sort of connection with Murray, because that's probably what ends up happening here. I just think it's fascinating that they paid this player. They were they were bullied into paying this player. Remember that? A holdout, some nasty Twitter stuff that he hadn't followed him on Instagram, all the bullshit we go through now in Gen Z, right? He did all this stuff as a three-year player with no pedigree, an awful playoff performance, got himself 200 million plus guaranteed, and now they're with stuck. That, with they're that stuck. language. Too, that yeah, contract. with the video game language, right. No, they. this should be free agent year number one for Kyler Murray. 
He should have been playing out his fifth year option right now. And there'd be no pressure on this organization and everybody would be able to make the decisions they want to make. And Collar on the open market would be probably a pretty good sell, but no, they got bullied into this contract. I'm going to finish on this statement. You tell me if I'm, I'm overthinking it. Should Jacksonville buyer beware here? I know it's recency bias with Trevor Lawrence, but man, I'm not seeing a lot of winning out of that dude. He, he is making non-winning decisions a lot, a lot. And Doug Peterson is a winning coach, you know, and I know he's kind of a gunslinger coach and he, he can be a rogue, rogue at times, but I, I'm not seeing Super Bowl out of Trevor Lawrence right now in terms of his, his ability to manage this offense. And he's up for a contract right now. And he's kind of the only guy that's sitting out there in terms of these rookies, right? Fields doesn't get in a contract. Trevor Lawrence is the rookie extension this offseason. Should Jacksonville pull the trigger? It's a, it's a great question. I think, I mean, I've seen enough to think that they probably want to see more if that, I know that's right. kind of like skirting the answer, but like, that's what we're going to keep. We're going to keep coming back to this question. I think every off season and every time we ask anything similar to like, what are you going to replace it with? And, not every team is going to be positioned to draft. Like it's nice when you're in position to draft one of these guys at the top, but that sort of relies on your team context. Otherwise too, like you, you don't, like you just said, you don't want to draft Caleb Williams and burn his rookie years when you have a roster that like Kyler Murray couldn't win with. I mean, I, listen, I, I got burnt by playing a lot of Kyler Murray on DraftKings.com <laughs> yesterday. And he is throwing, <laughs> He is throwing to guys that you've never heard of. Trust me. So. Oh yeah. Like, oh, no question. To think that's going to get any better. And like, like you just laid out like the kid. So inserting a quarterback into that same situation is not going to help anyone at this, at this certain, that's right. you know, at this stage. So yeah, I, I don't really know where any of these teams go from here, but um, Jack with Jack in terms of Jacksonville, in my opinion, they're going to just, they're going to do it right. These teams are just going to do it because if you, to your fan base, it's an extremely hard sell. If they've, if they seen, if they've seen enough from him and then you like turn your back and then go acquire, like insert backup quarterback here. Like, I, I don't know. Is that, is that going to fly? I don't yeah, know. But you've got, tough. you've got year four plus a fifth year option with Trevor Lawrence. There's time. The, the point is this, the, there's nothing stopping Trevor Lawrence from Kyler Murray in this situation and bullying Jacksonville into right. doing it right now. There's nothing stopping that, but Jacksonville sh absolutely should look around and read the room here and read the temperature. You know what I mean? And, and by the way, I'm not even, I'm not even sure they shouldn't take a quarterback at number 54 with their second round pick. And I'm not even sure every team shouldn't be doing this. If you have even a little bit of doubt on your quarterback before you pay him 60 million a year, because guess what? That's going to be the freaking number, Dan, because Dak Prescott's getting 60 million a year. I know what he looked like yesterday against Buffalo. That's what he's getting. All right. That's where this thing is going. This isn't 25 million a year anymore, right? This isn't an extension of a wide receiver contract like it used to be. The gap is unbelievable now between this position and everybody else. So you can't screw it up because it's not like you're screwing it up and it's just money. It is significant. It's significantly hampering your ability to do anything else on your roster. So I would be waiting as long as humanly possible with a player I'm not 110% sure of, and I'm not sure Jacksonville should be 110% sure on Trevor Lawrence. I guess that's all I'm saying. Yeah. Good way to, good way to reframe that for me because I wasn't really thinking of it like through that lens where they still have a bunch of time. And I do think that is a valid point as we, like we've talked about this in the past, but as these quarterback numbers get so freaking high, yeah. the, like in terms in, in a salary cap world, let me say you not that these players don't deserve to be the highest paid players in the world, but um, in a salary cap league, as these quarterbacks are ma approaching those numbers, it's going to be hard for me to think anyone should commit early and until they've really seen that, like the the track record of that player proving it over four 
plus years, maybe instead of these early two or three year or sorry, three year extensions, they can't extend earlier than that. So it's funny, right? Because this is kind of the genesis of this entire podcast today is these early extensions and who's benefiting from them and who can actually like there's there's no world where the Braves, uh, the, Bra- it's the Braves are a bad example because they've already won the World Series, right? But to me, there's no world where Jackson Cheerios, 82 million is ever going to make the Brewers look like fools. Right. It's just not enough money. You know what I mean? But if Trevor Lawrence gets $275 million guaranteed on March 12th and Jacksonville doesn't make the postseason for the next three years, comes something that's completely plausible, right? I mean, I mean they're, they're going to be fighting for their division lives here down the stretch here for 2023. I, they're going to look like idiots. And by the way, that's where Arizona is right now. That's where they are because they got bullied into a, th- a three-year extension. So I, I just think that the gap is so big, the money becomes so stupid out of the gate that you can't just do it. You can't just do it to do it for optics anymore. You have to actually consider what's going to happen to the rest of your franchise if you know if X goes here and Y goes here. So it's it's fascinating stuff because there's a lot of teams that struggle so much to find a sense, you know, a viable quarterback, but viable quarterback and 60 million a year have to be two different things. Right. And I think Baker Mayfield's proving that to go back to him. He is proving, you know, Jake Browning is proving that for, for God's sake right now, you can get away with a great roster and an above average quarterback versus a number one overall quarterback and an okay roster. You know, right. and I think I think that that may turn itself on its head here in the coming weeks. All right, we ran long. Again, we'll uh, we'll talk trade candidates in Major League Baseball here soon. We got to do our spot track year in review after Christmas. That's always a fun episode. And I gave you some homework on the Braves. I'd love to see any kind of number you can give us to what the Braves actually are paying versus maybe what they should be paying had they not given these guys early extensions pretty much across the board. Good stuff, man. Thank you. Thanks, White. <laughs> 